Thanks for having me. Right. My, our pleasure. We're going to be talking about again. Uh, and and I, I asked him, just so you guys know, because he knows, uh -huh. uh, to share with us some of the history about uh, things happening or have happened. Uh, in uh, the Detroit metropolitan area or Michigan. Sure. But one of the things that he's going to talk about, and we've been talking about that, the Rosewood Massacre of 1923. Right. And then, I, and this is, I, I have a book on this, uh, so I love books and I love to read, How Black Men Dominated Horse Racing, which is true, right. and we were winners. Mm -hmm. Right, well, well um, the first Kentucky Derby ran in 1875, mm -hmm. was run by Ol Oliver Lewis. He was, uh, he was an mm -hmm. African-American man, mm -hmm. 19 years old. Uh, the horse he ran on was called Aristides. And the trainer of the horse was uh, Ansel Williamson, who was a former slave, mm -hmm. okay? Because uh, horse racing goes back to slavery. We see mm -hmm. that horse racing was brought to the British colonies coming from England. And we see that um, a lot of the slave masters are going to have um, uh, slave males, boys, uh, as jockeys. Jockeys are usually short in stature, right. mm -hmm. lightweight, mm -hmm. and being a jockey could be very dangerous also. Sometimes they would strap them to the horse. That's right. Some would die um, mm -hmm. uh, riding the horses. But what happens is, is if you were a slave who had some type of skill, mm -hmm. you could box, you could wrestle, anything white people could bet on and make money off of, right? Mm -hmm. You could get some type of privileges. Okay, and this oftentimes is what happens during slavery. Then after slavery ends, we see because um, be, because they were um, riding horses and jockeys during slavery, this transitions to them competing in horse races after slavery ends in 1865. Okay, and we're and we're gonna we're gonna see this take place. So these were and and these brothers were making a lot of money. Um, we we look at uh, somebody like Isaac Murphy. He run he he was the first one to win the Kentucky Derby three times. Okay. And uh, these brothers uh, were some of the, after the Civil War ends, these were some of the uh, most prominent athletes uh, at the time also. Okay, mm -hmm. so Does I mean, that sound familiar? Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole hmm. history dealing mm -hmm. with them it is. that it really is, is lost. And today, if it you is. watch the Kentucky Derby or horse That's racing, right. right, you don't see, you don't see their presence. Not at all. It's been largely removed. That's right. Okay. That's so, right. so we're going to deal with some of this history tomorrow. And then also <coughs> this ties into, um, um, so, so we see them in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then we go into 1923 with Rosewood, right? Mm, and then we'll right. do we'll deal with a timeline of history leading up to the Rosewood attack because you have to understand these things chronologically, mm -hmm. okay? So you have um, uh, before uh, before the Red Summer 1919, February 8, 1915. You have a movie that comes out that's going to really have a huge impact on America. Now tell them again what about the uh, the the, uh, the Red uh, Red Summer. Summer? Right? Why is it called the Red Summer? Oh, For because the streets of America were flowing with blood because there were over twenty five major. Blood? Oh, it was it was our blood and white people's blood because okay. we were fighting back and shooting back right. and stabbing we back. We weren't just sitting back. We no, no, fighting. we never just sat no, back. No, no we always fought back. That's right. We look at the American Revolutionary War. There were five thousand uh, African Americans fighting the American Revolutionary War for 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 the, the, the colonies, mm -hmm. but but there were at least twenty thousand of us that went to the side of the British because the British were the first ones to say, "If you come fight for us, we'll sure. set you free." That's right. Mm -hmm. So we were born at night, but not last night. <laughs> so so we said we're gonna fight for the British. That's right. Okay. That's right. And then when the, when the War of eighteen twelve came as well many of us ran to fought for the british against the u.s so, the, mm -hmm. so september 13th 1814 this is when you have a white supremacist slave owner named francis scott key who writes um, a poem called defense of fort mchenry which becomes known as the white national anthem mm -hmm. this is why i tell people you have to understand the history it's not just the third stanza okay right. no refuge for the hollering or the slave this the entire song is a white supremacist song yes, this is yeah. why i didn't understand why miss gladys knight was singing Whoops. the white national anthem Whoops. at the super bowl she took the midnight train back to Georgia Whoops. and did the wrong thing. Right. That, don't, that doesn't even she make any sense, anything. okay? Mm -hmm. And then when you it, study... It's when you don't know your history yeah, or pay attention yeah. to Well, she's old enough to know better. She lived in segregation. To, but choose not to know your well, history. Well, see, that's, see so, we, so we have to Trust deal with this. And, then, yes. and I'm, not, I'm not trying to counsel her. Of course. I'm just saying, wait a second. She should be setting an example. You mean Cardi B has more sense than Gladys Whoops. Knight? On, on this subject? Are you kidding That's me? That's a show nothing about Come on. <laughs> Cardi B? Are yeah. you serious? <laughs> no, we study Jackie Robinson. That's right. We know Jackie Robinson and, for breaking. And what does Meriwether does? Tell it. Oh, Floyd Mayweather? Talk about oh, Floyd it. May the, 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 Floyd, Floyd Mayweather needs some help. Because, see, when you have brothers like that, mm. he's going to find himself in some trouble when really he's going to need his he people really and they're not going to come to his aid. That's right. Okay? Oh, he, he's going he's gonna, to, he's gonna, you know, him... Uh, uh, dropping two hundred thousand dollars on Gucci to make a point like to black people. You know yeah. where he was going with that? Huh? He was trying to make a point to us. 
Well, see, right. he said I can do it, and I will yeah, do it because okay. I don't see, follow see, anybody else. See, see that's that's gonna, what he there's going to come, there's going to come a time when he's going to get himself into that's trouble. That's right. And he's going to need Nobody's support from black people. Now, if you study Muhammad Ali, who's one of my heroes, yes. and you see me wearing my Colin Kaepernick shirt right Absolutely. now, because I haven't watched the NFL game in two years, right. including the Super Bowl, and he, and he got a deal today. We well, got a, 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 right. a, 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 a settlement in his collusion today. lawsuit, as well as Eric Reed, who's the second one to take a knee in the in the NFL because because. I've done two presentations then with Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. We studied Muhammad Ali, right, who's one of my heroes, yes. as well as Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Muhammad Ali, if you, you watch... keep if, up out there, guys. If, if, you watch, <laughs> if, you watch, if you watch the movie uh, The Greatest, yes. which is Muhammad Ali playing himself, there's a scene in the movie where he talks about why he didn't sell out and, and why he didn't go in the Vietnam War, right. why he didn't mm -hmm. sell out. And he said that if... Uh, he, he said he knew that if he... Uh, betrayed his people mm -hmm. when he was no longer no, no longer no good to white people mm -hmm. and they couldn't make That's any right. money off of mm -hmm. them off of them his people would not want him back mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and this is what people have to understand you, you know a lot of these celebrities a lot of these floyd mayweather things like this you need to ask yourself this question and and uh people like dr ben carson mm -hmm. they need to ask themselves this question what happens to you when you have outlived your usefulness to white supremacy mm -hmm. and they don't no, no longer have a uh, uh any usage for you because your people are not going to want you back. Well, history will tell you what happens. Mm -hmm. what, what, what was that? Oh, right. they, get, they get pushed out of the White yeah, House like Amarosa? I mean, right, they right. get pushed out like Amarosa? Right. Yeah. Mean, you don't have to go too far back to figure yeah, that yeah. out. So, I mean, so, right. so, so they have right. to ask themselves this question, okay? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you, we, we look at Muhammad Ali and we look at uh, Dr. King. Now, Muhammad Ali and Dr. King, they had a secret friendship that a lot of people don't know about. Mm -hmm. Okay, March 30th, 1967, there's an interview that they did together. It's on YouTube. It's only about a minute and 30 seconds. And this is uh, four days before April 4th, 1967, when Dr. King officially comes out in opposition to the Vietnam War. He delivers mm -hmm. his first speech in opposition called Beyond Vietnam. Later that same month, April 28th, 1967, Muhammad Ali refuses to be drafted into the Army. Okay, and these brothers are there talking, and they're being interviewed, and they, they and they wouldn't go into depth about what they were talking about. They had a private meeting, mm -hmm. but um, uh, Dr. King talked about how he was against the Vietnam War. Muhammad Ali, he had already been served the draft notice. Right. Okay, and everybody was wondering, okay, is he is really he not up? going to take that? Is he really not going to be inducted? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, uh, Muhammad Ali said, well, if uh, John F. Kennedy can meet with Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev is the head of the uh, head of Russia at the time. He said, he said, we two brothers could definitely meet. And he said, even though, you know, he's a Christian and I'm a Muslim, he said, we're still brothers. OK. Mm -hmm. And with, when we study Malcolm X. Right. Malcolm was calling for a unification of the civil rights movement while he was still in the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. There's an article from the Washington Post that deals with the day Dr. King met Malcolm X. I've done an entire show dealing with this. Mm -hmm. The day Dr. King met Malcolm X, March 26th. 1964, okay? Mm -hmm. This is uh, later in the same month that Malcolm officially separates from the nation of Islam, March 8th, 1964. They only meet for a couple of minutes. It's at the U.S. Senate debate mm -hmm. for the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Mm -hmm. When you listen to Malcolm's speech in the following month, April 3rd, 1964, and April 4th, 1964, called the Ballad of the Bullet. Right. April 3rd was in Cleveland, Ohio. April 4th was right here in Detroit. He talks about going to the Senate debate because they had a filibuster going on. The Southern Democrats called the Dixiecrats. Mm -hmm. They had a filibuster of the civil rights act, a 75-day filibuster. And he met Dr. King, and he told Dr. King that he was going to throw all his heart and effort into the civil rights movement. See, we don't talk about Malcolm when he separates from the nation of Islam right. and joins the civil rights movement, helps right. to radicalize it. Because if you actually read the text of the speech, Ballad of the Bullet, he's talking about injecting black nationalism mm -hmm. into the civil rights movement. Right. And this is what he does. Right. But but July 31st, 1963, the month before the March on Washington, which was August 28th, 1963, Malcolm sends a letter to Dr. King requesting a meeting with Dr. King. Mm -hmm. He invites him to a rally that's going to take place in Harlem, New York. And he said, we have to find a common solution to a common problem posed by a common enemy. Malcolm right. was calling for a unification yes. of not just the civil rights leaders, but also their followers. He, he was calling for a united front. Yes. Now, this is why he's still in the nation, okay? That's and then when he, he, when he comes out of the nation, he goes, to, uh, he goes on his highs to Mecca. He travels to African nations late mm -hmm. April and into May, right? He, he has a transformation, but his mind, but his ideology is already evolving while he's in the nation. Mm -hmm. But when he leaves the nation, now he can speak freely and speak for himself, mm -hmm. okay? So we have to study this, and, and, and just like today, we don't study Dr. King properly. We don't study Malcolm properly. Dr. Mm -hmm. King was very revolutionary. People should read the book, Martin, Malcolm, and America, Dream right. or Nightmare. Right. Because toward the end of both of their lives, their ideologies were converging. 
Okay? Mm -hmm. And so so our children are mistaught about Dr. King in school. They're taught about I have a dream. That mm -hmm. wasn't the original name of the speech. No, it wasn't. No. When you when you right. when you read the article of uh by Clarence B. Jones for the Washington Post that deals with the history of I Have a Dream speech, the phrase I have a dream didn't even appear in the original draft right. of the speech. I actually I've actually I've actually seen uh, draft copies of it. I worked for Congressman Walter Fontour. Okay. He was one of the writers of the uh, the speech, the actual okay. a speech itself. Absolutely, right? he, absolutely. And he still has this copies. Is it Stanley Levinson, right. uh, mm -hmm. Clarence B. Jones? Right. These were speech writers yeah, of Dr. King right. that, that, that put together they his put thoughts, the create the drafts. That's so right. one of the original names of the speech was mm -hmm. called "Normal Seed right. Never That's Again." Right. Right. Then later it was called a canceled check. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's going right. to be later right. that it's called "I Have and a Dream." He, and guess what? He mentions the canceled check. Right. In the speech. Right. Well, the, the council check was right. figuratively because right. he said, because right. I've done presentations where I That's break right. down what he said in the speech. Our whole concept yes. of what the speech was about has yes. been hijacked. Yes. Weapons right. of mass distraction. Mm -hmm. Right. He's he's talking about dismantling white supremacy and racism in the right. speech. He lays right. out the conditions right. that we're dealing economic with. Economic justice. Mm -hmm. Not just justice. economic justice. He talks about police brutality. That's he right. talks about racism. Sure he talks does. about voter suppression. Absolutely. Okay. He talks about the Negro moving from, he said, he said the Negro moving from a smaller ghetto to a larger ghetto. He said, we can't can't stop while the Negro in the South can't vote and the Negro mm -hmm. in New York feels he has nothing to vote right. for. Okay? Then, Mahalia Jackson screams out, tell him about the dream, Martin, tell him about the dream. Mm -hmm. So then he shifts and reverts to a speech right. he gave two months prior in Detroit called I Have a Dream. Right. Okay? Right, and then he hear. starts talking about that. Mm -hmm. But 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 the dream, the quote-unquote dream, is what happens after you have dismantled white supremacy and racism. And just so you guys will know, next sitting next to Mahalia was Dr. Dorothy I. Hyatt. Yeah. Yeah. National president mm -hmm. of the uh, Delta Council. Sigma Say, uh, mm -hmm. Delta Sigma Theta sorority, right. whose nephew happens to be Dr. Uh, Dan Aldrich, who lives here in Detroit. Yeah, yeah I know that. Yeah. Reverend Dan Aldrich. Right. I know. Right. I know him. Right. Uh, so th there's so much I'm history, and, and you notice how we go back to Detroit. Mm -hmm. Notice yeah. how we, uh, we we bring it all back. Well, yeah, well, this is where the nation right. is now. Was right. started in 1930. Right. 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 right there. Absolutely. Right there. Right. I'm gonna take a couple callers before we get to our next break. I'm gonna because they are. I mean, they probably gonna tell me we want to just listen, but we're gonna we're gonna take Mr. Detroit, question or comment, and we're going to go right down the list. Thank you so very much for waiting. Question or comment? Hi. How you hey, doing? Hey, how you doing? Good morning. Uh-oh. When I told this on the Bank Lake show, uh, he, Bank Lake told me, thanks for the history lesson. Okay. Due to our rich black history of Detroit. Detroit is the baddest city in the world for five reasons. Number one, <laughs> Ralph Bunch. It, uh, Ralph Bunch was a half-breed just like Obama. He went to oh Harvard just like Obama. Obama ran the world for eight years. <coughs> Ralph Bunch ran the world for 20 years. Second, Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis beat the Nazis. Third, Elijah Muhammad. If it weren't for Elijah Muhammad, wouldn't be no minister of Firecon or Malcolm X. Detroit is Mecca to the black Muslim brothers and sisters of America. Fourth, it's the last stop on the Underground Railroad. All mm -hmm. the slaves that came this way, once they crossed the Detroit River, they was free. Everybody know what number five is. Motown music, the best <laughs> in the world. Like all Detroiters, you have to be proud that you are from Detroit. Now I'm going to give you the history on me. Uh, oh, no, no, honey, not, 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 not here. You, you, you'll have to get your own show to do that. That's number one, because we got to go to a break, all right? Thank you, Mr. Detroit. I appreciate you, baby. Right. By the way, guys, I just want to, just an FYI, Minister Farrakhan is officially a Q. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. That's he's right. He's a, a Q. He's an honorary member right, of honorary Omega Sci-Fi. Oh, yeah, Omega Sci-Fi. Just I thought I just just dropped that. A in absolutely. There. Are you a Delta? Delta every day. Okay. And everybody knows uh -huh. I'm a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity uh, Incorporated. Right, Got my yeah. older chapter, Wayne State that's University. Right. Twenty nine years Howard, in the game. Howard University every day. Everybody I'm knows that. Shout out to Alpha Phi Alpha. <laughs> absolutely. But, 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 I'm but, Alpha Phi Alpha. Yeah, but very. Alpha Tau chapter. Yeah, but very quickly, yes. uh, once again, uh, mm -hmm. Saturday, February 16th, right. Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, right. 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., doing a double lecture dealing with the history of black right. jockeys and how we dominated horse racing, and then also we'll deal with the Rosewood Massacre of no 1923. For right. uh, those two well. people that don't know what Nandy's is at, Nandy's, right? 71 Oakman Avenue in Highland Park, Michigan. 71 Oakman and Avenue, time. Highland Park, Michigan, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. It's right off of Hamilton. Free event, donations accepted. Visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com for more information. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Or call 313-462-0003, 313-462-0003. Call after the show's over.
And if you want to get uh, any of the tapes or anything like that. Oh, I have my DVD lectures there. I'm I'm speaking at three different locations tomorrow because I'll be out in Inkster from about 7 to 9 at uh, the Booker Dozier uh, Recreation Center, 2025 Middle Belt Road. They're having a Middle Passage uh, ceremony. Okay. Okay. And I'm speaking there as well. All that information is at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. I thank you so very much. But uh, I want to make sure that we, uh, I want to make sure I got all the, because I, I just think it's just wonderful. Rosewood, you're going to speak about tomorrow. Oh, absolutely. Right. You're going to talk about how men dominate horse racing. Yes, yes. And uh, of course, you're going to talk a little bit about what's happening in Michigan and uh, how you just talked about Minister Farrakhan and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Dorothy. And, and, and we'll take and, questions. Uh, we'll right, take Dr. questions King from them as well. Yeah. And questions from them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. You enjoy this, don't you? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Right. How yeah. long have you, now, now, how long have you been speaking on? Uh, well, I've been speaking. Uh, since 2010. I, I was doing this back in college. I was, yeah. I've been studying right. 27 years. We have to. Okay. To uh, this but I've been, I started the African History Network in 2009. I started the African History Network show uh, March 10th, 2010. Uh, so I've been doing that nine years, right. the African History Network show. And you actually show. have a show on 9, 10. What yeah, time? Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the, the African History Network show will be on live this Sunday. So I'll be speaking mm -hmm. at a church Sunday mm -hmm. at 3 p.m. And then uh, I'll be here in the studio 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, also. So you can get him every Sunday yep. here. Right. So yeah, and, then, and, then, and then our shows are podcasted. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have almost 900 audio podcasts mm -hmm. of our radio shows going back to 2010. Now, if there was something, Michael, that you would express to African Americans mm -hmm. that they don't realize a little known fact about African-Americans. Sure. What would you discern? What uh, would you we've been in this land that we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. Uh, if you read the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. His book thoroughly documents the uh, presence of the Khoisan, who come from southern Africa, have the oldest DNA on the planet, go all around the world, that the ancestors of the Ainu and the Twa. There's a, a, a African presence of them in South uh, South America going back at least 56,000 years ago. Uh, so this was this was our land stolen from us. We don't understand our history. So we're going to have this commemoration uh, August 20, 16, 19, and we're told this is the 400th year anniversary of Africans first coming to these shores. Yes, that did happen, Jamestown, Virginia, 1619. At that point in time, slave statues don't exist in the, in the British colonies. At that, it, it, they, these people were actually indentured servants. We call right. them slaves because they, uh, uh, they were on a Portuguese slave ship called mm -hmm. the San Juan Batista, which, which, and there were 350 of them captured in uh, uh, Angola. And the ship is going to be hijacked by English pirates around Mexico. Mm -hmm. Fifty are going to be taken. They're put on two ships, the White Line and the Treasurer. And these ships come into Jamestown, Virginia, August 20, 16, 19. And the, and the captain uh, trades uh, 20 and odd Africans for food and supplies. But when you, when you read Before the Mayfly by Lerone Bennett Jr., he talks about how uh, they serve out their indentured servitude and they're sure compensated did. with land. Okay, and he talks about there's a uh, in chapter two uh, before the Mayflower. He talks about there's about a forty year period of time when you have uh, African people, some coming from England, some uh, captured coming from Africa, but brought into what, however they get there, brought into the uh, colonies, and they after they serve out their indentured servitude, they're going to be compensated with land. They can vote things like this. Now that's going to be as the slave statutes are put in place. 1641 in Massachusetts, 1661 in Virginia. That's going to be phased out, okay? But you do have that period of time. Now, the Spanish were bringing Africans into the territory we today call South Carolina in 1526. Mm -hmm. This is 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia. That's not even talked about because the Spanish were the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade right behind the Portuguese. Portuguese get involved in the early 1440s. The English come later. So, so they're trying to tell us we first came to this land conquered and shackled and changed by Europeans. That's a lot. It's we, all in who writes the history. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's right. It's, it's, it, the, the, our history in America, and, I don't, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna just use America. Yeah. I keep telling people we have to tell our own story. Right. We really have to tell our own story. Mm -hmm. We don't. You're just saying you're, you're only saying what was happening. Right. Exactly. The, someone else decided to write the history. I even say that even the Bible is written by certain people. I mean, all books are written right. by, and they are interpreted by, and written by, and you see from their eyes. What their story is, not our right. story, but what their story is. Right. Well, so you, you well, you know, prof story. Professor Kaba Hiawatha, the common name, formerly known as Booker T. Coleman, is one of my teachers. Mm -hmm. He says to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. Mm -hmm. So this is why when I teach about the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start in 1440, 1441. Mm -hmm. We have to go back at least 800 years prior to 
out of that 711 mm -hmm. AD when the Africans known as the Moors are going into the That's Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, because they're bringing Europe out of the Dark Ages. Okay, and, and and what they what they introduce into Europe is going to set up yes. the transatlantic slave, slave trade. It sets up Columbus sailing August third, fourteen ninety two. So we have to understand that chronology Absolutely. of history. Absolutely, you have to start from there. Yes. Well, we got we have. I know to we're do, coming up on we, a break. We got to do the same thing here at nine ten. Yes. <laughs> we have to learn how to tell time. Mm -hmm. I I told you guys this was going to be awesome. Just not enough time, but you can catch, <laughs> but you can catch him where again. Uh, Nandy's Knowledge Cafe, 71 Oakman Avenue, Saturday, February 16th, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. The information is there. And then also um, Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. Absolutely. Station. And I want you guys to stay on the air. I want you to tell us your history story, Abdullah, Ken, James, and somebody, and don't answer that. Right. <laughs> That's what it says on my, on that, don't answer. But you can't answer, you can't, you don't have a story, don't answer. But anyway, Abdullah, Abdullah, and I don't want you to go back to 1918 either. But I'll be right back. This is 910 <laughs> AM Superstation. I am Lavonia Perriman. I thank you so, so very much. Oh, no and problem. you need to be out there tomorrow. I mean, you can. we can go on and on, and you are invited back. Okay. Because I don't do just Black History Month uh, during the next 28 days. Oh, absolutely. 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 Thank you so very much. No we'll problem. be right back after these messages. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> All right, guys.